Mr. Prime Minister, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you uh, to the lecture that will be delivered by Prime Minister Suk Bhattarabhat Bol today uh, at our school. Now, for those of you who've been to the school before, you know that in any introduction, I always make three points. And um, my first point will be about leadership. And I begin with that point because Mongolia, small as it is today, has produced one of the greatest leaders of all time. His name, of course, is Genghis Khan. And uh, I mention him because uh, I remember Mr. Prime Minister, one of your predecessors mentioned to me that the only trouble with uh, uh, Genghis Khan is that he suffered from a very bad press. Because when you consider how much he achieved, he's only regarded as a you know, ruthless conqueror, but actually he brought peace and stability to an enormous region stretching all the way from the Caspian Sea to the Sea of Japan. And actually he was in many ways a very wise ruler, uh, introducing writing system, paper money, postal system, religious tolerance, and also a man who believed, surprisingly, in the rule of law. So I mentioned this, Mr. Prime Minister, because at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, we are always uh, teaching, trying to teach about leadership. We're looking for role models for leaders. And I commend Genghis Khan as a role model for our students also. My second point is about the country, uh, Mongolia. Uh, Mongolia is, in some ways, a very lucky country. Uh, it is the size of Western Europe, but it has a population less than Singapore, less than 3 million. It is now, as you all know, regarded as a dynamic emerging market economy and one of the last places on earth that has huge untapped mineral reserves, including coal, copper, gold, and uranium. And the IMF has already predicted that the nation will be one of the fastest growing economies of the next decade. Some reports say that Mongolia is going to become a new Asian tiger. Others say that it might become a Mongolian wolf. <laughs> so uh, in any way, it is going places. Now, let me see. My third point is about the speaker. And I can tell you that the prime minister is respected in Mongolia as a new generation business uh, and political leader. He's been elected twice as a member of parliament and as we discussed in my room earlier, both he and I had the same job as Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, in his case between 2000 and 2004, and he was also the Cabinet Minister of Trade and Industry between 2004 and 2006. In addition, he was Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2008 until his appointment in 2009 as the Prime Minister of Mongolia. He holds a PhD degree in economics from the Diplomatic Academy of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and is credited with establishing Altai Holding in 1992, one of the most successful companies in Mongolia. Prime Minister uh, Batbol will talk about the government's outlook for economic growth and national development strategy, focusing on the challenges and benefits of this forecasted growth. The Prime Minister will address us first, and then we will have a dialogue in which we'll also throw open questions from the floor. So Mr. Prime Minister, can I welcome you to the podium, please? Ambassador Mabubani, dear professors, students of the Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, ladies and gentlemen. Ambassador Mabubani, I thank you so much for your warm, warm words and also the welcome at this prestigious institution. I'm delighted to meet you all today and grateful for the opportunity to give you a brief overview on recent developments in my country. Both Mongolia and Singapore are located in Asia, but the distance between the two is rather long and they have manifest contrast 
as to the natural environment and weather conditions. Yesterday, the day before yesterday, when we left Mongolia, the air temperature was midnight, 30 below degree and uh, Celsius, and during the daytime, it's minus 20. So here it feels like it is summer at home. So you, you may certainly have heard and read about Mongolia and its centuries-long history, especially about the period when more than 800 years ago, the great Genghis Khan, about whom Ambassador Mabubani has made a very nice, and I would think and I would very much share with him the, uh, the opinion and view that he, is, he was a great person and great leader who has united Mongol tribes and territories and succeeded to create a powerful empire in the world and also to contribute and they made contribution to the civilization in many extent. And it was a, also a kind a very fortunate for me today also during my official visit to Singapore to open the exhibition on the Chinggis Han at the Art Science Museum at Marina Bay Sands. Chinggis Han, the exhibition, the largest collection of the Chinggis Han artifacts ever assembled so far and making an exclusive Asian appearance in Singapore. It, was, it is a very symbolic event, especially during this visit. I hope which would brought, bring Mongolia closer to Singapore and to this part of the world. Today I would like to briefly tell you about the current goals Mongolia pursues and how we strive to achieve them. I see the good name here, the Mongolia's fastest growing economy in the next decade. It is a good opportunity, but the very strong challenges. Over the 70 years, up until 1990, Mongolia was part of the so-called socialist system with a centrally planned economy that controlled most of the national assets or almost all national assets and the resources under one party political structure. Since the start of the democratic reform processes in 1990, Mongolia has developed it into a country with a democratic political system and market economy, where the human rights and freedoms are honored and in open foreign policy is pursued. Today, about 70% of the country's GDP is produced by the private sector. Along with the liberalization of the foreign trade, modern technologies are rapidly introduced and they bring quality to our citizens' everyday life, even to the nomads. To this effect, I would like to make just a, a couple of examples. For instance, in 1996, the number of the mobile phone users was re only about less than 1,000. Whereas today, or as of last year in 2010, this number has grown up to 2 point, almost 4 million, almost 80 or percent, almost close to 90 percent of the population, which is, as Professor mentioned, under 3 million, are using the mobile phone service and having, enjoying the, and getting the benefit of the modern civilization. The present, the total population is slightly under 3 million, and it is now possible to use mobile phones and have access to internet in almost any corner of Mongolia that covers the territory of almost 
million square kilometers, which is equal to the size of the Western Europe, as been mentioned earlier. So this advantages give us opportunity also to move things forward and to bring the world closer to people in Mongolia, in not only in centers of the provinces or in the capital city, but even in herders' families. With the number of motor vehicles, for instance, it's been for with the last 10 years, just the, the numbers been increased from four to five times. So these figures demonstrate the extent of the changes taken place for last 20 years when Mongolia has started the process of democracy and the market economy. The transition into the new system has brought not only positive changes though, but also challenges and difficulties. The tens of factories and business entities have, have bankrupted and closed due to the inability to manage in the new environment, resulting in the new increased unemployment and poverty. Now we are moving forward from the transition period to, the, to that of accelerated path of economic development. We have a great potential to reach that goal based on abundant natural resources such as gold, silver, copper, coal, uranium, and iron ore. There are many others I could name. In addition, Mongolia's over Mongolia has, has over 30 million heads of livestock and that provide additional resources to process of agricultural products including meat, milk, hides, and hides skins, wool, and cashmere for domestic consumption and more importantly for export. Mongolia sets a target to transform its resources into economic cycle and increase the economic capacity and enhance the overall well-being of citizens, our citizens. As an example, in 2009, the government signed an agreement for major gold and copper project called OT, Oitolga, located in the South Gobi, and now began to commission it. This deposit alone is expected to yield our uh, 45 million tons of copper, 1,800 tons of gold, and 400,000 of molybdenum. There are many other projects like this. And the development of next project of Tawan Tolga coal deposit, located also in the same area, has launched in the beginning of this year. This deposit has got almost 7 billion tons of high quality cooking coal. And if annual production and exports are considered to be, let's say 30 million tons of coal, it's expected to have my life for 200 years, just in average. So this mineral deposit is considered to be one of the largest mining deposit of this type of. So by developing this massive coal deposit, our economy would significantly expand and its GDP is expected to increase by 15% in the years from 2011 and 2015. And per capita income could be uh, doubled and possibly tripled. There would be many other projects except these two. As I've mentioned earlier, uh, gold and silver and copper and many other uranium strategic deposits held by the government and also, there are assets held by the private sector and international investors in Mongolia. With the new mining deposits, Mongolia's export structure and volume are changing. If just several years ago, Mongolia exported a few kind of commodities such as copper, and con copper concentrate as a raw material, gold and fluoride and cashmere, now it exports also coal, petroleum, zinc, and iron ore. More particularly in 
1999, Mongolia produced 5 million tons of coal for only domestic consumption. Then last year, in 2010, production was nearly 30 million tons, and most of it was export to China. And we become one of the top uh, exporter of coal to China. As a result of the oil prospecting, there is an increased potential for oil production in Mongolia also. In 2009, Mongolia ex exported already 1.8 million tons of crude oil. And this could be increased in much larger scale. The problem is, uh, although we have the crude uh, the oil and the oil prospects and uh, potentials, but we don't have the oil refineries yet. This becomes not only difficulty, but it is it becomes an opportunity for the investors also, and for the government. From these facts, it becomes clear that. Mining industry and mineral sector is, a, is and would be Mongolia's driving and leading force for economic development for next decade. Now I would like to stop quoting the, number, quoting the numbers. Instead, I will talk about the issues we face and that need to be addressed. Though we possess massive mineral res reserves, the opportunity to, to export our products is narrowed to other countries, but our neighbors, China and Russia, because of our landlocked position. Most of our foreign trade is with our neighbors. For instance, presently ne nearly one third of our export goes to China, and over 35% of our import comes from Russia. Therefore, it is vital for us to broaden our facilities for exporting our goods and services. In this regard, we have decided to build more infrastructure facilities, including the railway. And government and parliament of, of Mongolia has approved the new policy of infrastructure development and railway. So we are, we are planning to build just within short span of time, over 1,000 kilometers of railway lines in the southeastern part of the country where the main mineral deposits are located to connect with Russian railway network in the Far East. This will open for us a second outlet to access the sea through Russian Far Eastern ports. In addition to the existing one to China, we have existing railway, which needs to be again improved and increased in capacity and directions to China. This also gives us an opportunity to export the goods to industrialized countries such as Japan, Korea, and Singapore, and to Asia Pacific region. Meantime, we will decide to build industrial complexes to process the raw materials. Because, as, because of the land lockness, what, the, the freight cost, what Mongolia is paying, is uh, enormously high. It equals up to 10% of our GDP. So for us, it is very important to encourage devaluating, and for this purpose, we have started drafting the project to build industrial parks, which would contain the industries to process copper, iron, coal, and others. This in intends to reduce the export of raw, mater raw materials and produce value-added products for export. And this provides an opportunity for, again, to the inv investors industries and countries which has technology to work with Mongolia to share this benefit to contribute to the development of my country. Also, it is important to lower the transportation cost, of course, meantime. We also expect to establish suitable market costs of growing our, 
our export, exporting destinations for mineral products, that will in return increase the competition. Due to the limited market alternatives, we ought to sell those mineral products sometimes at certain cost, which is less than international market price. So we need to also deal with this by having other options, having industries, processing, and other alternatives for export, and as a market, as logistics, as infrastructure. Mongolia imports almost, although we do have the crude oil, as I've said earlier, we don't have refineries yet, which is still, again, opportunity for investors and government and industries. We now import oil products from Russia, almost fully dependent on Russian oil products. In such way that the industry and the economy is still vulnerable, depending on a single market or major suppliers. We have a policy in place to further diminish this interdependence and especially dependency. So oil exploration and processing are need to be increased, and especially in the Gobi area. And we have that plan from the government point of view. And we, that is the project to build oil refinery. This successful implementation of such project would ensure and would meet the domestic need and supply of oil products and significantly will shrink our dependence. One of the biggest challenges for the mining country is the price, price fluctuation on the market. In the years when the copper price is good, we enjoy very much, but in the years we have a downturn, we face serious difficulties because the economy is not really diversified and at this stage, it's quite, and especially before we had the coal export in a serious position, we had a serious dependence on a copper price. Sudden price fall of minerals and raw materials causes revenue losses and holds back the development of the economy itself. So we have been through these difficulties and troubles many times. For instance, in the years when the copper price has dropped 300 percent as our main export commodity that had this we had a difficult time which had a severe impact on our economy so it is imperative for countries to strengthen cooperation and co uh, coordination they and they prevent actions against this type of risk of the future price fluctuation on commodities, and we need to have this uh, policy to diminish this dependence again. While expanding our mining sector, we are attaching equal importance to the reinvigoration and development of other sectors of our economy. Natural resources are exhaustible. Someday in the future, they will be dissipated. Therefore, our goal is to improve the whole structure, capacity, and self-sustainability of the economy. Mongolia's another precious asset is its livestock. I've mentioned earlier, we have about 30 million heads of animals. The projects and programs we are currently implementing are aimed at not only increasing the size, but also improving the breeding quality, efficiency, and keeping the livestock healthy. By processing high quality animal products, including skin, wool, cashmere, meat, and milk, we are targeting the expansion of both domestic and equally importantly, the export markets. In this regard, we held fruitful negotiations with the European Union, for instance, and we succeeded in acquiring the preferential access of duty-free access for almost over 7,200 items produced 
in Mongolia for European market. In order to effectively draw on this pleasant opportunity, standard and quality of Mongolian export goods need to meet the European uh, international requirements. Recently, Mongolia and European Union initialed the Partnership and Cooperation Agreement, and our intention to develop closer cooperation with European Union, with European standards and norms. We are also working with our other partners, including Japan and other countries in the region. And uh, with Japanese counterparts, we are discussing the establishment of the agreement, signing of the agreement on economic partnership between our two countries. It is a part of our policy to be dynamically involved in the regional economic integration. So the issue of the food supply is at the core of the attention both domestically and globally. The global food pr uh, crisis which occurred three years ago has left us a bitter experience to learn from. Thus in the 2008, my government started to implement national program for rehabilitation of agriculture which gained substantial progress so far, and we are becoming self-sufficient in wheat and basic vegetables as a result of this program, what we have launched in 2008. Another important area of economic development is tourism. The vast land, land mass with the combination of the Gobi Desert and mountainous regions and steppes with the four distinct seasons as well as rich and ancient history of Mon Mongolia attracts many foreign tourists in the recent years. Nowadays, we give a particular attention to nurture up tourism industry related infrastructure. Everyone in this room is welcome to Mongolia. <laughs> Certainly, summer and autumn are amazing season for to visit Mongolia. However, I believe a taste of pristine and refreshing winter of minus 30 to 40 <laughs> degrees Celsius will become, a, for those uh, in the hot countries, will be lifelong memory, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> I believe that the fundamental for the Mongolian development is knowledge of its people. Therefore, my government attaches high significance in further improving our education system in order to develop the country further. We consider that Singapore is the most vivid and closer model for, to us for creating knowledge-driven growth. Mongolia is eager to learn from your experience for this very purpose, and we encourage our trade and investment and develop the an objective interaction in the field of the banking, finance, education, and other areas. And we had a very good discussion yesterday with the, the Prime Minister of Singapore on those issues, on the issues of our bilateral relations, on the issues of opportunities where we can work together and mutually benefit from our cooperation. We have identified a number of areas of cooperation where we can compensate each other, we can, we can learn from good experience what Singapore has gained for its success. So it is a very good opportunity again to talk. We had a good opportunity to talk to Singapore business community this morning, again to share those opportunities what we have and we are offering to our partners. And this is the purpose of my current visit. And, and we are aiming to achieve these goals. Housing and, imp and, and improvement of living standard of the people became one of the pressing issue of the gov my government. There is an acute need to address the issue of decent and affordable housing. More than 30% of Mongolians live below the poverty level. In Ulaanbaatar, poverty is the highest among the migrants. Those who those living in traditional tent gear and settlements. 
In addition, these care residents face problems of overcrowding as well as a lack of access to water supply and health services and produce air pollution in Mongolia, in, especially in Ulaanbaatar, the capital city. Singapore is regarded as a successful example of affordable housing production pursuing efficient housing policy. Yesterday, I visited House, Housing Development Board of Singapore and its gallery and was impressed with the Singapore's experience of urban planning, cost-effective public housing, and production of the quality homes and living environments. The government is implementing, my government is about to implement a project of 100,000 affordable houses. And we are keen to introduce the success, successful experiences of Singapore. As a part of Asia and Pacific, Mongolia stands ready to be an active and effective player in the region, regional economic and trade investment cooperation and interdependence. Thus, we are working to promote the political economic ties with ASEAN and its member states. So henceforth, accord a pivotal importance to our relations with Singapore in order to accomplish these goals too. With the liberalization of foreign trade in 1990s, I remember, because I was also in business at the, at the time, I, was, I had a, a good experience of business for seven, eight years, which I've started the early 90s also. Our youth started to travel abroad and engage in trading of the goods and commodities in neighboring countries, including Singapore. And we, I, we all know, especially M Mongolians, well that they have brought electronic goods from in bulk from Singapore to provide the Mongolian population with them. And also we brought them to Russia. I'm uh, of the view that there is a vast room between our two countries to fill with more effective cooperation in the field of trade today, economy, culture, education, and healthcare. So in conclusion, let me wish you every success in your good work, in your good endeavors in academic work, in the research study, in whatever you pursue at present. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you. I have the great uh, privilege of asking the first question. Thank you. And I'm going to take you, take you back to the days when you were Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, also Minister of Foreign Affairs. And when you're comparing Singapore, the similarities and differences in Mongolia, one similarity that we have is that Singapore is a small country. We have a big neighbor in the north and a bigger neighbor in the south. Yes. Mongolia is a big country, but small population, with a big neighbor in the north, and an even bigger neighbor in the south. <laughs> so tell me, what are the lessons you learned managing big neighbors that we can share with Singapore? <laughs> That's, I think, a very good question. Because <laughs> uh, we learn and we live with this every day. <laughs> As you say, we never choose neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, neighbors choose have, us. <laughs> and uh, but, uh, we think that uh, we have great neighbors. Yeah. And uh, our neighbors are great opportunities for us. Mm. Mm. We think that uh, now with these uh, uh, new uh, opportunities, I think we can grow and benefit together. Mm. And uh, in our foreign policy concept, we give priority of our foreign relations to our neighbors. Mm -hmm. But we do, again, by having this importance uh, with, in our relations with our neighbors, we would like to welcome our other partners. And we call them, because we are, we have kind of 
not physical neighbor as a third neighbor, but we put that into the basket, which is called third neighbor concept, our friends and partners beyond of neighbors. And we have third neighbor policy concept. Mm -hmm. And we would like equally to strengthen and in increase our relations with our third neighbors. So Japan, South Japan, Korea. Japan, North America, European Union, and Japan, South Korea, and ASEAN countries, and mm -hmm. India, and many other countries. And we very much encourage them to have mm -hmm. the a more active participation and cooperation so that we have balance of the interests of our neighbors, mm -hmm. including to our neighbor, two neighbors and third neighbors. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, I think we have this policy and our neighbors understand and appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, like an example is uh, with a major copper gold deposit, we have international investors like Rio Tinto mm -hmm. and Canadians, so that we would like to have this balance and based on the technology and financing and management and know-how. So mm -hmm. that would be the thing, and we talk it very openly and very clearly with our neighbors. Mm -hmm. and we have very, we enjoy, as I said, mm -hmm. very friendly neighborhood relations with our neighbors. I'm, I'm pleased to inform you that that was also the strategy of Singapore's first foreign minister, Mr. S. Rajaratnam, who said that we can leapfrog across our region and network with the rest of the world. Sure. And that's why he did. Before I turn the floor open, let me ask you one more question. I was recently in Oslo, Norway, and at something called the Oslo Energy Forum. And one thing that everyone was talking about is how wise the Norwegians have been in preserving the earnings from their nat yes. natural resources <clears throat> and saving it for future generations. So as you mentioned in your talk, yeah when the day comes that the natural resources run out, they have created this huge fund yes. that will, in a sense, support future generations. Do you have a future generations fund in Mongolia too? Yes, I think um, this is exactly the, the most important challenge for the years to come, mm -hmm. for the dec decade. Certainly we'll have a good uh, inflow of money, cash to be produced out of the money, mm -hmm. but how to manage it the number one issue, for the government especially, for the public. And uh, we thought that we, don't, we should not reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. We went and uh, my government and my, uh, our parliament members and uh, experts went to Chile, mm. Canada, and not, not in Europe. And uh, we have created the uh, similar type of mechanism mm -hmm. and uh, we got now we um, uh, the parliament has approved the new law on stability law mm -hmm. so that we have created stability fund mm -hmm. when we enjoy the good price for commodity excess revenue we put into the uh, stability fund and uh, in the days of difficulties we would use it for the future generation the other thing is we have created human development fund mm. that will channel those benefits to the all citizens of Mongolia on equal opportunity basis. Mm. So that government will handle the healthcare, mm. education, and the, the issue I just talked to you uh, housing. is housing. Mm. So that we and of course the job opportunities. So, but healthcare, education, and housing will be uh, taken care of through this human development fund, which will give an equal opportunity and mm. to all citizens that they would benefit from this mm. for the future generations to come. Great, thank you. The floor is now open. Please, can you identify yourself, please, to yes, the prime minister? Yeah. I'm Choi Yong Hai, first parliament being for me, so casual. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, I have two questions. My first question, in fact, is uh, along similar lines that of your first question. Uh, well, we are much aware, as you and the Prime Minister have said, uh, of the mightiness of Mongolia and the greatness of some of your forefathers, not just Ganesh Khan, but Kublai Khan also, in the past, when in that region, in your region, it was already a frontier land, uh, large frontier and 
without borders, almost without borders. However, you are now located in very well-defined uh, well, well defined borders. As you say, uh, Ambassador Kishov, Russia in the north, China in the south. How do you see the geopolitical situation of your country in the next maybe 10, 20 years vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other countries in the region and vis-a-vis -vis the world? Especially when you have so much natural resources and many countries in the world are in fact competing for natural resources. So that's my first question. My second question also concerns the uh, location of your country. I'm a small investor in a mining company that holds uh, several concessions, mining concessions in your country. And uh, of course, the nearest port, like Russian port and Chinese port, are about one, 2,000 miles away from your country. And the rail system, as you say, is being developed. Uh, if it's not well developed, it's going to add to the cost of exports of all the minerals that you are going to extract from the ground. Uh, so I would like to know what sort of plans you have ready to develop that system, that transportation system. And it has to be real because the road transportation is not feasible because it's such a long distance. And the other uh, factor, of course, is that uh, for sub, uh, a few months in a year, Mongolia is in a sub-zero uh, weather. And it's very difficult to mine, especially if it's you know, underground mining. I don't know what sort of concessions you could give in those sort of, uh, you know, during those periods when you are actually operating in those sub-zero. Thank you. I should, I should mention, Mr. Prime Minister, that Ambassador Choi Yong Hai also has had a distinguished career in government and business like you. Thank so. you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. I think about the first question, people like to talk about that, especially uh, geopolitics. The geopoliticians and geopolitics. For us, first thing is, how do we make our country yes, to be successful and, and economically uh, developed? And we, to do that, we think that we need to, have, we need to be good friends, uh, we need to have good, good friends with our neighbors, and we, good, we need to welcome, as I uh, early mentioned, our third neighbors to invest into Mongolia, so that we have a good balance of interests and more, more or less sustainable and developed economy, which hopefully we would lead to the certain value adding and industries. The other thing, what we think for us is important is our political system. We do have true functioning democracy in Mongolia. And this is, a, firstly, in the best interest of people of Mongolia. And to further strengthen the democratic institutions in Mongolia, to keep the stability and to keep the independence and interrelation with the rest of the world, especially with the, our friends and the third uh, neighbors. And we see a quite, a, a quite an achievement in our, these endeavors. I met recently in New York the, the president of Kyrgyzstan last September. She was talking to me, the your system is quite good. We would like to learn from your experience. Because you have true functioning democracy with the parliamentary democracy. And we will have one, because they had the system of president, and they, are going to, they were going to change it into uh, the parliamentary system. And 10th of October last year, they had the election to the parliament. And we do have countries of more or less, with more or less the same background in Central Asia, in Northeast Asia, so that if we succeed with our model of democracy and market economy, even within this location between China and Russia, where we have completely different systems, although, uh, but we respect each other's political system and presence, I think this would be a good example for many other 
countries in the region. And this, again, this is the, the interest of the countries supporting and working with Mongolia. So if we sophisticate further the achievements what we have made throughout of our democratic process and strengthen the institutions of democracy and civil society and business community by having equal interest and from our friends and neighbors, I think this will strengthen not only our position, but our relations with our countries. And I think they would, this would match to the interests of our neighbors. About the second question was? was about uh, the connection to the ports. Yeah, connection uh, to the you, ports. How do you, are you going to build railways? Yes, and, uh... I think uh, it's about nearest port from our border to China. It's Tianjin. It's about less than 1,000 kilometers, I think. So mm. to some extent, it's so possible. That the, only the gateway through Russia is a bit far, over 3,000 kilometers. But we are negotiating because there is a certain, there are certain rules that landlocked countries have some advantages and privileges by having access through the transit of the neighboring countries. And Mongolia has initiated the concept of the group of the landlocked countries. And we have got international think tank established in Mongolia under the patronage of the UN Secretary General who has visited two years ago Mongolia and uh, with my visit last year with UN General Assembly, we got this ratified by the member countries of this landlocked group. We are working on international <coughs> agreements on a multilateral basis. On the other side, we work with our neighbors on a bilateral basis, on trilateral basis also, to get the competitive transit trade cost and transit tariff on a governmental a G2G level. And we, are, we are in a series of uh, fruitful discussions with Russians now. Uh, we are in tripartite discussion with Russia and China on transit tariffs as a landlocked country. And I think uh, that will give us opportunity to diminish the cost. But the more important thing is we need to make more value back in Mongolia to cut down, the, to reduce the cost of the transit again so that we do not completely export the raw materials. So the government policy will be supporting and encouraging the technology and value adding back into Mongolia. I see lots of questioners down there. We'll Thank start you. with my colleague. Please go ahead. Stavros Yanuka, Lee Kuan Yew School Prime Minister. I'm a, a student and admirer of your country's history. Uh, that history offers an opportunity for you, for your country, to exercise uh, an enormous amount of soft power. Uh, at one point or another in history, China, India, Iran, as well as Russia were ruled by royal families that had links uh, to Mongolia. What are your thoughts about uh, using that history as a form of soft power? Thank you. His question is, how do you very recreate good. Genghis yeah, Khan yeah. Empire once yeah, again? Yeah, 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 that's very good. <laughs> I hope we're doing it here. <laughs> but uh, as I said, this, uh, this country has got a long history and rich history. And, uh, uh, the promotion of my country uh, and with the exhibition like what we have today in Singapore mm. is good for, for the world to know about Mongolia and for Mongolia it is good to be known again with our recent history and present situation and we would very much, very much encourage this kind of diplomacy of promoting cultural and uh, other events, including the, which would hopefully support tourism and other industries in the future. So I think there are many ideas to make best use of this, our history and identity from not only Mongolians, from many international experts who are experts in our history, in, uh, in certain <coughs> subjects like Genghis Khan and with his uh, 
um, sort of concept and uh, history. So I think uh, there could be many good options and opportunities to make better use of this soft power. So I would very much encourage if you, if somebody has good idea, we would definitely be looking at into. <laughs> Great. Thank Next you. question. Mr. Prime Minister, um, it's good to have you here. I'm from Mongolia, and my name is Alta. I miss the cold, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have many questions, but I guess I will um, ask you only two questions at this time. Uh, the first one is, since you are here in Singapore and it's your state visit, um, while you are here, what's one thing that you would take um, with you and uh, bring it to Mongolia and implement it? Um, the second question is about the sustainability. Uh, during your office, you emphasized the, the developing the business environment and uh, especially the development of the capital market as well. What is this, this policy will be, how sustainable this policy will be? Do you have any more, any policy or plan that you can continue with this policy? Thank you. Good, thank you. So um, I think there are many things as I've already mentioned to learn from S Singapore experience because S Singaporeans have done great work, the people of Singapore and government within to succeed within the relatively short span of time to come to this level of development. And the, the, there are many things we would like to pick up, but we have two things in mind. Uh, first comes to us. There are many things, but first is education. The education system in Singapore, and we would like to learn, and we have had the discussion within our, my team, there is a minister of education, and uh, he's talking with his counterpart here. Uh, we have a, the, the program, education program uh, with the Singapore government, but we would like to make it more focused on uh, improving the quality of education, especially training of the teachers. And I think we should start, in order to get a good quality uh, students and uh, citizens, you need to start from the teachers. So mm -hmm. we focus on the teachers program with Singapore government. I think that's a very important area. We think that we need to. Second is, uh, the housing, because Singaporeans are very proud that almost 90% of the Singapore families are owning the apartments. And in Mongolia, we have only about 26% of our population have got modern apartments supplied, <coughs> modern housings. So this is a great challenge for us, and uh, the great success what Singapore has done in this field is uh, quite of interest to us, and uh, we have made some discussions. I've visited Singapore HDB yesterday, and my team is working today with them to enable it in a, in a way that government can be more efficiently supporting this program. About the capital market, I think uh, that's an important thing because all the assets, what I've just mentioned, are, of course, firstly to the benefit of Mongolia, and of course, the, this would be to the b benefit of the investors. But Mongolians cannot benefit as citizens if those are marketed and listed in international stock exchanges, not in Mongolia. They, they, they would not have an access because of this level and the conditions and the infrastructure what we have. So we decide, we have decided to link our capital market with the global network. To do that, we have announced international tender for the management of the Mongolian Stock Exchange. And we're, the Mongolian Stock Exchange is in this negotiation and I understand they have completed the, and signed the uh, agreement with London Stock Exchange to run the local stock exchange. So hopefully we'll have the capital market and the infrastructure in, into the certain standard so that the companies which are listed on international stock exchange, having asset, Mongolian assets will be required to list, to have a dual listing on Mongolian stock exchange. And there will be many other uh, opportunities, I, I hope they would follow once we develop our own capital market. <coughs> I hope one of the things you'll take away from Singapore, Mr. Prime Minister, is the need to send more Mongolian students like her. 
Absolutely. So <laughs> that's for sure. That's, that's the good thing. <laughs> Please. Uh, sir, my name is David Halpert. I'm, like Ambassador Cho, also an investor in your country. Uh, I've spent some time studying some of the other Central Asian countries, and I'd like to say congratulations. Thank you. Based on that experience, uh, you're clearly doing a great job. Uh, I'd like to ask about immigration. Um, as you may have noticed, Singapore has a lot of foreigners, including me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I read somewhere it's 35% of the population now here. Uh, it's a politically complicated decision, uh, but arguably you need foreigners. Uh, do you think Mongolia will become more liberal about immigration, or should we not expect that? That's a very sensitive question you are asking. <laughs> it's also sensitive in yeah, Singapore. Yes, <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> very sensitive question. But uh, would, you have finished, or you want to still continue to ask? Or you just sorry? Th that's a good one. <laughs> okay, okay. Then uh, what I'm uh, what I'm trying to say here is, I think uh, because of these opportunities what we have, and because of the re if, uh, numbers of the people in labor uh, we have there, probably there will be demand for many reasons to welcome more foreigners to Mongolia. Only thing. And I've, I've been to United Arab Emirates. Mm. I've been to Kuwait. I know that Singapore has got 3.5 million people, but on top of that, 1.5 foreign, million foreigners, including half a million permanent residents. You're very well informed. Very, yes, I, I know the number, because it's a sensitive <laughs> issue for me and for my government. <laughs> and uh, we are looking at this issue, but the important thing is I have my Minister of Justice in the interview here with me and members of the parliament from both uh, parties, or the, which have majority of the seats in the parliament. We think that we need to improve the quality of our legislations in respect of the foreigners and foreign workers and uh, uh, immigrants. There is a lot to be done there, and a lot to be learned from countries like Mongolia in terms of size and in terms of population and uh, necessities. So Singapore is a good example for that. Okay. Okay. Hey, one more question, water? Water? Water, water. Water, 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 is, water is a big issue. We discussed again yesterday here, also with the Prime Minister of Singapore. Because we do have, from one point, we have enough water. From other point, we do not have sufficient water. And Mongolia is, you know, very, has got vast land especially the southern part of Mongolia has not enough water. Uh, we need to bring expertise of water management, mm -hmm. waste management and treatment, and reuse of the water. So this issue was on, of, on, on, under agenda in my discussion with the Prime Minister, and uh, I think Singapore has got a good experience in other countries, mm -hmm. so we need to pay more attention to water issue in Mongolia. That's the definitely a very serious issue for us. And we have an Institute of Water Policy, the Lee Kuan Yew School also. Oh, that's so even can. better. <laughs> <laughs> we can send somebody on the train here and that's learn right. more about this. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you. Uh, my name is Randy Fabi. I work for Reuters. Um, I was wondering, has, uh, I just have two questions. Has, the, um, has a bank been chosen yet on, uh, who, on, on managing the IPO for uh, Tavan Tolgoy? And, uh, sorry, managing what? Sorry, the coal mine Tavan Tolgoy. What? What? Who is chosen? Has a bank been chosen? Has okay, a bank okay. been chosen That's yet good. to manage the IPO uh, yeah. for for that for the coal mine? That's a very specific question. Yes, I'm a journalist, <laughs> so I try to get as specific as I can. Yes, yes. Uh, and a little broader question: What type of companies are you looking for uh, to develop this mine? And can you? And is there? Uh, any companies already making the shortlist that you can uh, tell tell us? Oh, Thanks. <laughs> you, you, you are a journalist or journalist, journalist, banker? Journalist. <laughs> okay. One of two. 
I see some bankers here, <laughs> and uh, I believe this, they're expecting what I would say to them. <laughs> so That's why they this is very answer. secret. <laughs> I'm joking. As you know, Mongolia, as I've mentioned, we are pursuing the policy of the policy of transparency and um, as a democratic country, and we have uh, announced open tender for the financial institutions and Mongolian relevant agencies like State Property Committee and the relevant, relevant company, LDNS, MGL and LDNS TT, and the board is considering, I understand, and uh, the banks. And we are enjoying very much uh, the interest of the international financial institutions and we have, I was very excited to hear that top 55 banking institutions were in Mongolia a couple of weeks ago with the interest to participate with this specific coking coal mine IPO. And that's very good. It's very good for us and good for the investors and good promotion. And we think that this will be very op uh, open and fair and competitive process, which due to be within this month, as I understand, but uh, as a prime minister, I have no uh, sort of information, first of all and no involvement to this process. But so, I know that this will be, uh, because they are good candidates, all good ones, and will be the best ones to be selected and mm -hmm. appropriate ones to be selected mm -hmm. uh, to this process. Mm -hmm. And that's an appropriate answer to a specific question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have three questions and five minutes to go. Mr. Sure. Mr. Pr Prime Minister, if you agree, we'll take the Thank three you. together. And I'll just take notes so we can help you remind you. So please, my colleague Astrid, please. Uh, my name is Astrid Tuminas, Vice Dean of Research for the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I have a short comment and a short question. The comment is, I applaud the, the clarity and courage of Mongolian leaders to choose democracy as your political system in a region where that is definitely not the default option. My question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, to expedite the development of Mongolia, you definitely need to send armies of students abroad to study in the best universities, learn the best skills, become as sophisticated as they can be, and return to your country to help build the state. Would you please comment on the evolution of Mongolia's education policy in the last two decades, and how many of your students are returning to Mongolia to participate in state building? Thank you. Mr. Prime Minister, I have a question on education as well. My name is uh, Saurabh Roy, and I work with the Research Support Unit. Um, continuing on what uh, Astrid said on education, uh, one of the glorious examples of uh, development is uh, in North Africa, Libya came down to Singapore, and they took Singapore's primary school education model, went back, replicated it, and today Libyan students are actually learning the way Singaporean students are. Do you envisage on any such plans of cooperation with Singapore wherein you can take back the education system from here and implement it so that your students can benefit? Yeah, good. So the okay. first question about education, education overseas. Yeah. How many students are coming I back am, from yeah, Mongolia? I, I remember. Okay, uh, I come, uh, because education, two questions, I will combine them. First is the primary school and the secondary school. We're exactly uh, learning and getting this experience so that, as I said, we do not want to reinvent the wheel because we had the system up until 1990, more or less Russian system, and then we are trying to apply to the new system what we are pursuing now. And two years ago, we decided to make it very clear and precise. That was, we we choose the Cambridge system. And now Mongolian uh, schools, and the Cambridge system uh, is tested in, in Singapore, and you have success on that. And we are working on the curriculum and other programs with the Cambridge, uh, and we would like to enhance it with the Singaporean um, cooperation. And that's the thing what we are starting to implement. It takes time and uh, resources and uh, Many things, including the, the tra tra training of the teachers and the facilities and everything, but it has started. The second thing is, we have about 200,000 Mongolians living abroad. Many of them are studying uh, on a G2G basis funding, and most of them are on a private sort of capacities. 
studying. And with the potentials what country is offering to the world and itself, the, there is a good trend to come back to uh, our, um, the, for Mongolians to come back to their own country to be part of this progress in prosperity and to contribute. But the important thing is we have to create the opportunity and the environment for them also to come back from the government point of view in terms of job and uh, other opportunities. So I think this process is now just have started and we are working on it because we think that enormous value comes from the Mongolians who have made experience and learned in abroad. Uh, other thing is, other question is, and we are, we are sending more and more of students and the, with the government funding and uh, with, again, uh, we work with the, uh, countries and governments to get some assistance and cooperation in terms of education. For instance, with the United States, we have joint Fulbright matching fund where we invest and the Americans put money and we train through this fund financing. So we do have such fund to be accumulated and accelerated further in with many other countries. We do have ones. We need to promote it for, uh, further. I agree with that. Then the there's a question, question about JP Morgan about the timing of bonds. Timing of bonds, yes. One at a time. So we, we, are, uh, we are about to start with almost many things at the same time. And uh, <coughs> there is a certain clear in, intention to come to this issue, but uh, we are still working on it. Uh, hopefully, the latest next year, but <coughs> might be to, to the second half of this year, we might come to the bond issue. The last <coughs> question about the 600 commodity licenses that were ah, revoked, and that, uh, how do you address the question of yes, investor confidence? Yes, I think that's the, now, the, this is a young democracy. The many licenses were issued in 90s. When, if you just imagine this is a five years old, by a five years old democracy, seven years, well, and a lot of mistakes have been made from certain uh, many things. But by having, and the, the, because it is a very vibrant democracy, there's very strong public opinion to make them and to make some amendments to the mistakes. The government wants to balance the possible changes in a legislation in general, but it has to ha deal with the, the things which were completely wrong in some cases. But I'm not talking about this uh, law on a forest and uh, water and other, it's a very long name with this law. But this comes from the, again, environmental issue. And we understand that this would fall, uh, create a lot of consequences in terms of business, reputation, stability, and the environment, and uh, cost. So parliament has made such a decision. Government is working on it. Government wants to fix it. And probably in order to have, for us, to keep the stability and predictability and accountability uh, uh, then transparency is becoming very challenging issues and we want to, and my government is committed to deal with these issues and we would like to come back to our parliament with our proposal that we cannot make such and such, and such things. So uh, we understand there is a concern and we would like to deal with this in a proper manner. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, you've certainly given us uh, a lot to reflect on. We'll leave with many impressions, but I think that one uh, strong impression you'll take away is the sense of optimism that you have for your country. And I think I, I will certainly leave you feeling much, feeling with much greater confidence in Mongolia's future. And I suspect that if Genghis Khan were alive and in this room, he'd be very proud of what you have done to, to, to encourage confidence. <laughs>